quite frankly, you know, most actively managed funds are going to fail. It's just simple arithmetic. Welcome to episode six of the Canadian Couch Potato podcast, where we help you become a better investor with index funds and ETFs. I'm Dan Bordelotti. On this episode, I'll be joined by strategist and researcher Christopher Davis of Morningstar Canada. Christopher and I will discuss his research on a concept called active share. But before we jump into the interview, I want to explain a little about this concept so our discussion will be easier to follow. Back in 2009, two finance professors at Yale published a paper called How Active Is Your Fund Manager? A New Measure That Predicts Performance. This paper introduced an idea that the researchers called active share, which is a way of measuring how much a mutual fund or other portfolio differs from its benchmark. So to give an example, imagine a U.S. equity fund that holds all 500 stocks in the S&P 500 index. That fund would be identical to its benchmark, and it would therefore have an active share of 0%. And that would be an index fund. Almost by definition, pure index funds have an active share of 0. Now, imagine an actively managed U.S. equity fund that used the S&P 500 as its benchmark index, but the manager only likes half the companies in the index. So he eliminates the other half from the fund, and then he doubles up on the stocks that he favors. So this fund would have an active share of 50%. Meanwhile, a manager who concentrated his bets on only 50 of the 500 stocks in the index, or 10% of them, would have an active share of 90%. Now the goal here is to be able to identify managers who are genuinely active, that is, those who act on their beliefs rather than simply buying just about all of the stocks in the benchmark and then just tweaking around the edges. So the researchers claim that by doing this, by looking for funds with high active share, you can improve your odds of choosing those that would go on to beat their benchmark. Active share predicts fund performance, they declare in the paper. Funds with the highest active share significantly outperform their benchmarks both before and after expenses, and they exhibit strong performance persistence. Now, this makes some intuitive sense when you think about it. I mean, if you're a manager whose goal is to beat the S&P 500, you probably don't want to buy 450 of the stocks in the index. Because if you do, chances are pretty high that your returns are going to look very similar to those of the index. And after fees, you're probably going to lag. Any good stock picks that you might have made are going to get diluted and have very little impact in your performance. But if you were to concentrate, say, on 30 to 50 stocks, that's a high active share, then you at least have a fighting chance because your returns are likely to look quite different from those of the much larger benchmark. Now, not surprisingly, the concept of active share got a lot of attention. Uh, Stock pickers liked it because it suggested that they had skill and really could add value even after fees. Um, It also got a lot of criticism, but uh, most of that commentary, not surprisingly, had a U.S. focus. Uh, But then in 2016, Christopher Davis at Morningstar Canada tested this idea on Canadian equity funds. He wanted to see whether the funds with the highest active share really did go on to outperform in future years. So let's hear some more about his work. So joining me here in the studio today is Christopher Davis, who's strategist at Morningstar Research Canada. Christopher, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dan. Okay. So before we discuss the findings of your research, I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of active share and the claims that its proponents make. So can you just discuss the concept a little bit? Well, active share is a concept developed by a couple academics. Um, They developed it in 2009. And and the idea is pretty simple. It's trying to describe how different a portfolio is from its benchmark. Um, You know, so for example, an index fund would have 0% active share because it's exactly like the benchmark. However, if the fund looks nothing like the benchmark, it would have an active share of 100%. And so something in between, if it's active share of 50%, it means half its holdings match the benchmark uh, and half don't. So that's in in pretty simple terms. Okay. Now, when when the researchers first uh, announced this concept of active share, um, they positioned it as something that had some predictive power. So can you talk about a little bit about you know, what, how investors might be able to use active share as a way of 
predicting future performance. Yeah, I, th- I think that the paper said uh, a new measure that predicts outperformance. That was the the title of the of the paper, and you know it way overpromises. And I I understand why. I mean, to come out with an academic paper that says, "Hey, we found a new interesting measure that describes uh, you know how different a portfolio is from its benchmark," isn't going to get anybody to read it. You have to promise uh, you know that it's going to outperform. And so that's what the initial research. Uh, indicated, and it was simply on U.S. equities uh, initially versus the S and P 500. Um, you know, and the uh, researchers found that more active funds outperformed less active funds, and it has real intuitive logic, right? I mean, you know, if a fund is really different than its benchmark, it should be more likely uh, to outperform. Should be easier to outperform if if you're different. Um, looking like the benchmark makes it hard to beat the benchmark. Um, and then when you attach the sizzling claim that, you know, this very simple measure can tell you whether the, a fund is going to outperform or not, you know, investors and other academics and researchers like myself just glommed onto it right away. Now, there was a lot of criticism of the active share research when it came out from various sources. And for listeners out there, I'm going to post some links to uh, some of these critical articles on my blog, CanadianCouchPotato.com, so you can check for that. But as always, you know, the best way to test a theory like this is just to see how useful it would have been predicting real-world fund returns. And so that's exactly what you did in your research. So why don't you describe a little bit about your methodology? Yeah, so, you know, we didn't want to just look at um, the Canadian universe over the past 10 or 15 years, um, you know, see how the funds did and then looked at their active share and then drew some conclusions. You know, we wanted to see that if you, you know, put yourself uh, in investor shoes five years ago, 10 years ago, and chose the most active funds, how you would have done over the subsequent time period. So we did that over a 15-year time period uh, from 2001 to 2015, broke that into two 10-year periods, uh, and then uh, we broke those 10-year periods into two five-year periods. The first half would be what we would call the observation period. We wanted to see what the average active share would have been over that period. And at that end of that five years, you as an investor would be looking back to see how active the funds uh, you're thinking about it, investing in were. And that's how you'd be making your decision. So you know, we wanted to simulate our study using that uh, methodology. And then we just looked to see how the funds did over the next five years um, and, you know, uh, ranked the the results by quintile and, and, you know, came to our conclusion that way. So just just to clarify then for listeners, so the uh, the f- two 10-year periods yeah. came over a 15-year span. So there was an overlap. So the first period was 2001 to 2010. That's right. And then the second one was 2006 to 2015. And so if I understand correctly, the idea would be, let's say in the first period from 2001 to 2005, you would look at the percentage of active share in the group of funds. That's right. And then you would see how that percentage of active share would have been useful or not in predicting the performance in the next five years, so from 06 to 2010, right? And then you did the same thing for the second 10-year period. Right. I should right. hire you as the spokesman <laughs> for my paper. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so with that methodology clear then, what would you describe as a sort of top-line findings? In other words, what was the relationship between active share and subsequent performance? Well, it depends on the period. And I think that's the most interesting finding here. Um, Our first period that we looked at, um, the first 10-year period, active share was uh, not just useless in predicting performance, high active share actually led to worse performance. Um, And then when we looked at the next 10-year period, the opposite was true. A uh, higher active share led to to better performance. So you know, a really robust measure should work. You know, over multiple time periods, and we didn't see it in our case. And there are other studies out there as well by Morningstar and others that have made similar observations. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's there's always an ability. You know, you can always look backwards and say, well, in this particular period. You know, the funds that outperformed had higher active share, but that is just sort of explaining something after the fact. What you're looking for with any of these measures is some kind of predictive power. And it sounds like you didn't have that here. You had it in one period, but it was worse than useless in the second period. So they kind of cancel each other out. Over the 15-year period, I think it would be safe to say as a Canadian equity investor, 
looking at percentage active share would not have been a helpful measure. Is yeah, that fair? Well, at least not by itself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not arguing that active share is a useless measure as part of your research process. It's just that it's not going to by itself per, uh, forecast outperformance. Now, one of the interesting things when you look at a concept like active share working over one period but not another is uh, I think it's helpful to look at, you know, what unique characteristics uh, were in place during those periods. And as we said, in the 15-year study period you looked at, you had these two overlapping periods and both the first one and the second one included the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Right. So that was if not a unique event, certainly a real outlier in uh, the last 15 years, had a huge effect on markets around the world. How do you think that would have played into this and affected the findings in some way? Well, um, the financial crisis was only included in one of the performance periods. So, um, you know, the the first 10-year period. Uh, In the second 10-year period, we measured active share, uh, but we looked at the results in a period of time where the financial crisis had dissipated. Uh, But what was really unique about that first period wasn't just the financial crisis. It was the fact that all stocks of all stripes, in fact, assets of all kinds, you know, went down together. And so when you just, when you have that kind of environment, it's hard for active managers to distinguish themselves, or it's at least harder to do so, um, you know, because Picking one stock versus another or picking one sector over another makes less of a difference. And so that's the kind of environment we saw uh, during the financial crisis. And so it's not surprising that active managers had a harder time adding value during that period. Um, and you know, more active funds are obviously the active managers doing more things to differentiate themselves. And it didn't matter so much because uh, you know everything was going down at the same time. Yeah. So it's <laughs> there's only so much you can do as a stock picker if you're picking you know this group of stocks versus that group of stocks during a period like 08, 09. They were all going down one way or the other. Whereas in a less volatile period, you maybe have a more of a fighting chance. Right. That's the idea. Okay. Um, I did want to ask you as well about active share and risk, because one of the criticisms I hear about index investing frequently is that it's riskier than mm-hmm. active management because you there's no place to hide is what you know the quote that you hear from time to time. The idea being that as an active manager, you have a little bit more control over um, underweighting or excluding altogether specific companies that you think might be overvalued or highly risky. And you can go into cash. Yeah, exactly. Now, what did you find uh, in the study in terms of the relationship between active share and risk? Well, I think this was probably, um, you know, the the biggest surprise, you know, because we assume taking risk or deviating from the benchmark is risky, that it um, puts your portfolio uh, at risk for losses or will make your portfolio more volatile. And, you know, we found that really wasn't the case in either of the periods we studied. Uh, Highly active funds were uh, just as volatile as less active funds. Um, They suffered uh, similar losses uh, in down markets. So um, it really doesn't hold water from that perspective that, you know, index funds or index-like funds are, you know, somehow more or less risky. Where there is a difference, though, is index-like funds tend to have less volatility or tracking error versus the benchmark. Um, You know, so if you're really worried about how volatile your fund is versus the benchmark, then yes, more active funds are more risky. But if you think about risk in the way most normal people do, you know, what's my risk of losing money or um, thinking about risk uh, as, you know, more semi-normal people think about uh, in terms of just pure volatility, um, you know, activeness within the Canadian context, you know, really, really didn't make a difference. Yeah. I think it's really only people in the investment industry who measure risk according to you know, volatility versus the benchmark. And so, you know, what that means, um, you know, for listeners who might not be familiar with this idea, it's so if the benchmark is up 10% one year and your fund is up 11 or nine, you know, there's some deviation from the benchmark. And if you are an active manager or a financial advisor and you're benchmarking your returns against an index, that is a risk to you because it makes you look bad. Um, However, 
to the average investor, when you ask them, what would you consider to be risky in a fund? They're thinking about losing money, right? right? They're not, they don't really care too much relative to the benchmark. Right? Um, so another interesting idea that you discuss in the paper is this idea that Canadian equity managers seem to exhibit less active share than managers in other countries. Now, I wanted to ask you a little bit about why. I mean, at first my thought was it's just because Canadians love their banks and energy stocks so much and they can't bear to build portfolios without right. them. Um, so why, why is it that, that Canadian equity managers seem to just in general have less active share in their funds? Yeah, that, that's what I thought going into this um, and especially talking to Canadian equity managers all the time. They're just a bunch of benchmark huggers. They're afraid to take bets versus their benchmark. And yes, Canadian equity managers on average are less active you know, than uh, managers who invest in the U.S. or invest globally. But part of that is just a reflection of what the Canadian market looks like. Uh, we're a really compact market. Uh, there's 300 or so stocks in total in the benchmark. Uh, it's concentrated in a few sectors. And so um, you really don't have a lot of choices if you want to deviate. And if you do, you're taking uh, a potentially big risk to your career at least. Uh, you know, when you do deviate, um, you may, your, the decision to uh, distinguish yourself from the benchmark might pay off over the long haul. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, uh, investors are often very short-sighted. And when we ask managers, um, you know, one of your potential advantages is thinking more long-term than the market. Why don't you do so? And they're like, well, I, I agree with you, but my clients... Um, expect me to outperform over the next one to three year period. And if not, we're out the door. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, a immense career risk to deviate uh, from the benchmark. And it's more costly to do so in Canada than in the US. Uh, if you leave out a couple banks in Canada, you're making a bigger risk than leaving out uh, you're taking a bigger risk than if you had left out, let's say, Wells Fargo or Citi or J.P. Morgan. Uh, you know, if you're an S&P 500 kind of investor. Yeah, it's it's sort of difficult to imagine a Canadian equity manager, you know, not holding at least some of the big banks in significant proportion in their fund. Or, um, you know, if you're the Canadian equity manager who decides you're not going to hold any energy stocks in your fund, well, now the chances of you outperforming or underperforming the benchmark become huge, which is great if it works out for you. Yeah. But boy, you're probably going to get fired if it doesn't. Right. Yeah, I mean it's a huge risk, and and you're going to outperform in in years like um, 2011. But you would have looked awful last year by <laughs> you know skipping out on energy. Um, and you know investors really don't want to cope with those kind of wild swings, um, and, and neither do their managers. Mm. Now, related to this idea is uh, a term called closet indexing. Yeah. And my understanding is that this is a phenomenon that's unusually common in Canada as a function of the characteristics we just talked about, yeah. about the, the concentrated nature of the Canadian benchmark. So can you talk a little bit about what closet indexing is and why it's generally considered a recipe for underperformance? Well, you know, closet indexing, it's a very cleverly named term, um, you know, it simply means that uh, you're you're an actively managed fund by name only. You know, your portfolio looks a whole lot like the benchmark, uh, but you're selling you're selling a, a portfolio at actively managed prices, um, and so that's why it's doomed to fail. You know, cost is very predictive of long term returns, so higher cost funds tend to underperform. And if you look like the benchmark, it's going to be really hard to to outperform a high uh, expense ratio. Um, you know, so that's why closet index funds get a bad rap, uh, and justifiably so. But I, th I think the uh, active share literature is a bit unfair in how it has these, you know, absolute targets uh, in what constitutes a closet index fund. And by that, I mean um, anything anything that has less than sixty percent active share, you know, is considered a closet benchmark or a closet index fund. Um, that means most funds in Canada are closet index funds, but it also means almost all Canadian-based global equity funds are, you know, highly active managers. And it just kind of uh, defies reason or credibility to think that, you know, Canadian asset managers tell their Canadian equity managers, you know, 
don't take any risk versus your benchmark. Uh, but then, you know, turns around and says to the global equity managers, go out and be cowboys, take all the risks that you want. It's just in nat- the nature of the 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 beast and, and the benchmarks that are, they're competing against. Yeah. At first, I kind of thought it was just sort of the Canadian or the, the Canadianness of equity managers. Yeah. You know, are they just by nature more conservative, less willing to take risks? But you're saying not really. It's just they're much more constrained in their choices uh, when it comes to a Canadian equity fund, and when they're given much more flexibility in a global equity fund, then they take advantage of it. Right. So I I don't think that this is intrinsically a risk averse market at least by, from a portfolio manager standpoint i think the investor base often uh you know can be maybe more conservative versus some of their global counterparts i'm originally from the us um and i, I would say investors there have a bigger appetite for risk okay yeah that's a that's an interesting behavioral concept for another uh, podcast for sure. <laughs> um, so I did also want to touch on the concept of fees because in your research uh, you used performance data gross of fees. So mm-hmm. in other words, you ignored the fees on the funds, which actually makes perfect sense for research purposes because if you're going to compare different fund managers, you need to level the playing field. And so if someone who's managing a fund that charges 1% might be less skilled than one uh, managing a fund that charges 3%, and we want to remove that and test the skill level, right? Right. But as you know, and as you refer to in the paper, investor returns are always net of fees. And so um, how is cost correlated with active share and how does that affect the end investor? Well, more expensive or more active funds are more expensive and you know, considerably more expensive. Uh, on average, the least active funds uh, had an MER of about 1%, and this is in the fee-based channel. So you don't have trailers, trailer fees, or advice fees, or or anything like that. Um, and the most active funds uh, had uh, expense ratios or MERs of 1.6%. So pretty big difference uh, between the, the most and least active funds. Um, so even if you believe that uh, active share higher active share leads to better performance. Uh, and the data really doesn't bear that out. But even if you decide to, to ignore my findings, um, in reality, more active funds may underperform just because they're more expensive. All right. So um, we talked right at the beginning of our interview about the idea of active share as a predictor. And the findings, I think, are pretty clear. It's not really a useful predictor uh, for future performance, at least not on, on its own. So what is the best predictor of future fund performance, if you could narrow it down <laughs> to a couple of factors? Okay. Well, I mean, price is probably the most useful predictor of returns. Um, and the reason it's so useful uh, relative to other um, predictive factors like returns is because all of those other predictive factors really don't work. So, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results. Um, you know, but fees are, are predicted because you know what they are. You can forecast what they'll be over the next three, five, or 10-year periods with a quite a bit of precision. You know what kind of returns the market is likely to give you over the long haul. And so I can forecast what percentage of the fund's return is going to be frittered away uh, in fees? So I think it's really important to pay attention to that. And then there are other uh, elements that perhaps on their own aren't predictive, but when you add them together, um, we've found them to be useful. So you know, looking for things like not just experience management, but management that is suited for the mandate that um, you know they're they're taking on strategies that are repeatable trying to take advantage of some kind of replicable investment edge, you know, that they can you know, do again and again and again. Um, you know, good performance over the long haul is kind of a proof statement that what they're doing is working, uh, perhaps. But I think you have to look at the complexion of that performance. Does it make sense given the, uh, you know, given the strategy? So if they say they're a conservative investor uh, and they did really well and Wild and woolly 2016, where you know materials were off to the races in Canada. Um, you know, then I'd, I'd question whether uh, you know they really have a conservative approach. So performance always tells a story, even if it's a story you don't necessarily like, at least in the short term. If it's consistent with what the fund is trying to accomplish, um, you know, we tend to look uh, more positively on, on those kinds of funds. You know, but quite frankly. You know, most actively managed funds are going to fail. It's just simple arithmetic. Uh, 
um, you know, and it's just going to be an elite few uh, you know, that will eventually do so. And you also have to be able to forecast ahead of time which funds are the ones that are, are going to outperform. So it's a it's a tough game to play. Um, you know, it's what Morningstar does. So obviously we believe that you can have success in 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 winning this game, um, but most people won't win. Right. All right. Well, thanks very much for all the work you do. And uh, thanks for the research. We're going to post a link to it on the blog as well. And Christopher, thanks a lot for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Dan. I appreciate it. If you're interested in learning more about the ideas Christopher and I discussed in this interview, visit my website, canadiancouchpotato.com. I'll include links to the original papers on active share, as well as to the Morningstar research. Unlike academic papers, Christopher's report is not technical at all, it's quite readable, and I was very pleased to see that he even includes a couple of Monty Python references. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time! And it's time once again to scour the financial media in search of... Bad investment advice. This time our search lands us inside Gordon Pape's mailbag. Now Mr. Pape, as many listeners will know, is a veteran author who specializes in writing about mutual funds and more recently ETFs. And his mailbag column is a regular feature on the Globe and Mail website. In a recent edition, he received the following question from a reader. Hypothetically, let's say that there are two mutual funds in a portfolio. Fund A has an MER of 2.5% and Fund B has an MER of 1.5%. Both funds report exactly the same return for every year after fees and expenses. My question, in this hypothetical example, why would I care about mutual fund MERs if the net return is the same? Actually, why would I care about an MER at all? Shouldn't I only focus on the return? To which Mr. Pape wrote the following response. I'm glad some people understand what I've been saying for years. The only number that should matter when judging mutual funds is the net return to you. If a mutual fund with a 2.5% management expense ratio returns 10% a year after expenses, and an ETF with a 0.5% MER gains just 8%, which would you choose? Clearly, the mutual fund puts more money in your pocket than the ETF, even if its costs are higher. This is not to suggest people should ignore costs. However, judge them against returns before deciding. Wow, okay, so what's wrong with this logic? Clearly it's true that at the end of any given period, an investor would have been better off with an expensive fund if it went on to deliver a higher return than a low-cost ETF. But the problem here and really this seems so obvious I'm surprised I have to explain it, is that you can't know ahead of time what a fund's return will be. Performance can only be measured after the fact, and by that time it's too late to do you any good. I think Mr. Pape here is making the common logical error of judging a decision by its outcome. I'll use a couple of analogies to make this point. So if you're a baseball fan, you know that trying to steal home is a risky play with a low probability of success. So if a slow runner tries this play during a crucial moment in a game, he's usually going to be thrown out and everyone in the ballpark will agree that it was a bad idea to try. But once in a while, the catcher will drop the ball and the runner will be safe. Now when that happens, do we say that the runner made a good decision to try to steal home? No, he made a dumb play and he just got lucky. Or say you're playing poker and you're drawing to an inside straight. This is a draw that you're going to hit about one time in ten. Now, if the pot is small and your opponent makes a big bet, you should almost always fold here because 90% of the time you're going to lose. Now, if you do call the bet and your miracle card arrives, then yeah, you're going to win a lot of money, but you still made a terrible decision because the odds were heavily in your opponent's favor. Well, the same is true about the decision to pay 2.5% for a mutual fund. Right? With a fee that high, the chance of outperformance is small. The vast majority of time, you would have been better off with a low-cost ETF. Now, your chances of success are certainly not zero. In fact, in any year, it might be as high as 30% or 40%. But over the long term, the chance of outperformance is much lower. And making a wager when the odds are stacked against you is always a bad decision, even on the rare occasions when you win. So the point here is that although some active funds will always outperform, there's no reliable way of identifying these winners in advance. 
Returns are always backward looking. They tell you little or nothing about future performance. But listen to Mr. Pape's answer to the reader's question. He says, if a mutual fund with a 2.5% management expense ratio returns 10% and an ETF with a 0.5% MER gains 8%, which would you choose? But this doesn't make any sense because I have to make that decision before I know that one returned 10% and the other returned 8%. Right? A runner on third base doesn't know whether he's going to be thrown out or whether he'll be safe if he tries to steal home. A poker player doesn't know whether he's going to hit that straight until after he's thrown the chips into the pot. And the same is true with an investor who decides to pay an additional 2% in fees for his mutual fund. Sure, he might do better than the cheaper ETF, but we know the odds are low and we need to judge a decision not by its eventual outcome, but by the thought process that went into making it. Now, Mr. Pape's answer clearly implies that he believes past outperformance is a reliable predictor of future returns, and that's a claim we know is untrue. Countless studies have demonstrated this, and that's why mutual funds are required to put a disclaimer to that effect on their marketing material. All right, so let's return to his original reader's question. Why, the reader asks, should I care about MER at all? Shouldn't I only focus on the return? Well, my answer to this is simple. Of course you should focus on MER. Costs are known in advance, and as Christopher Davis pointed out toward the end of our interview, they are the single best predictor of fund performance. Choosing low-fee funds significantly improves your odds of good performance over just about every time period and every asset class. Returns, on the other hand, can only be known in hindsight, and past performance has never been a reliable predictor of future results. So, suggesting that investors should happily pay 2.5% more in management fees if a fund has performed well in the past would be useful for Marty McFly and his DeLorean, but for the rest of us who can't travel back in time with that knowledge and buy the funds that would go on to outperform in the future, it's another shining example of bad investment advice. Now it's time to reach into our own mailbag, and with me, as always, for the Ask the Spud segment is my colleague, Amanda DL. So, Amanda, what is in the mailbag today? So, we've received some variation of this question many times lately, but this specific one is from Stephen in Calgary. So, Stephen says, I want to follow a disciplined passive investing approach, but my difficulty is getting started given current market conditions. I understand that timing the market is not really possible, but I also think that getting in during historical high valuations is not prudent either. So what are your ideas and suggestions for investing a large lump sum today? All right, thanks for the question. Let's all agree that we're enjoying an unusually long bull market. Uh, Over the last five years, ending in February, a portfolio that had equal amounts of Canadian, U.S., and international equity index funds would have delivered returns in the neighborhood of 12% a year, led by U.S. stocks, which returned about 20% annually in Canadian dollars over that period. If you've been sitting on cash during that time, you paid an enormous opportunity cost for doing so. So if you're now thinking about investing in an equity portfolio, I don't blame you for feeling anxious. In any case, moving a lot of money into the market is always stressful. But let's examine this idea that now is a particularly dangerous time to invest because, as our listener says, stock markets are showing historical high valuations. Is that actually true? Well, it depends which market you're asking about. If we use traditional measures of valuation, such as price to book and cyclically adjusted price to earnings, it's actually really only the U.S. and perhaps the Japanese market that seem expensive today. Uh, The U.S. is certainly not seeing historically high valuations. These ratios are certainly high today, but they're nowhere near where they were in the late 1990s, for example. And meanwhile, most other major markets, including Canada, international developed markets, and emerging markets, appear reasonably valued, even a little bit cheap by these measures. So the U.S. might be overvalued, I don't know, but if you plan on building a diversified portfolio, you're not making an all-in bet on a single market, and I think it's helpful to keep that in perspective. Even if we agree that not all markets are overvalued, what about this idea that markets are now at an all-time high and that this suggests that they're due for a correction? So indeed, as of early March, the S&P 500 was not far from 2,400, which is uncharted territory for this index, so it is near an all-time high. 
But let's remember that a stock market index, it's not like a thermometer. You know, it doesn't move up and down according to some fixed reference point. It's designed to increase as the stock market itself grows. And since markets go up more than they go down, one should expect indexes to hit all-time highs relatively frequently. And it turns out that they do. There's a very interesting article just published by a financial planner in the U.S. named Jason Lena. I'll put a link to it on my blog. And he points out that since 1950, and I quote, the S&P 500 index has closed at an all-time high on 6.9% of all days, close quote. So that's about once every two weeks during the last 67 years. Uh, More tellingly, he goes on, the index has been within 5% of its all-time high on 46% of all trading days since 1950, close quote. So if you're concerned about investing when the market is near an all-time high, it turns out that that's true about half the time. Now, what about this idea of waiting for a pullback and using that as an opportunity to buy cheaply? You know, it sounds like a great idea, but this too is fraught with all kinds of challenges. So first, a pullback might not come for a long time. I mean, historically, markets see a 10% correction about once every year, year and a half on average. But we have seen periods of three and four years without one. And what happens is the market can quickly run away from you. And when that pullback finally comes, it still might not bring prices lower than they were when you first made your decision to sit in cash. Second, although investing a large lump sum after a big downturn sounds appealing in theory, very few investors are able to pull the trigger. So if you're anxious about investing today when returns have been very strong, you need to ask yourself whether you really believe you're going to feel less anxious after markets have plunged and every news story you hear is forecasting blood in the streets. I mean, consider that we saw a pullback in August 2015 in the Canadian market. Uh, and then the market went on to lose even more the following winter. It didn't bottom out until January of 2016. Now, at that time, the Canadian economy looked to be in pretty rough shape and the prospects were bleak. Uh, Now, it turned out that would have been a great time to buy because Canadian stocks went on to return about 23% over the subsequent 12 months. But how many investors decided that that really was an ideal time to invest a large lump sum of cash? So, If you are nervous about investing a lump sum, here's my advice. I think first of all, you need to accept that you can't time the market. So don't say, I know we can't time the market, but just end the sentence. I know we can't time the market, period. No matter what you do, it is very unlikely that your timing will turn out to be ideal. So just accept that investing always involves that kind of uncertainty. Second, you need to understand the risk inherent in your portfolio. Your equities are almost certainly going to see losses of 20% with alarming frequency. Okay, A 20% loss is a routine bear market. And historically, these have occurred every couple of years. And once in a while, you're going to see losses of 40%, maybe even 50% over a period of a few months. That's what happened in 08, 09, and it could happen again. So if you don't have the time horizon or the stomach to endure losses like that, that's okay. But the solution is not to time your entry point. It's just to choose a much more conservative portfolio. Finally, I would invite you to consider the idea of investing your lump sum gradually. So for example, invest 25% of it today and then another 25% every four months. So you'll be fully invested within a year. Now, a very large lump sum might even be invested over every or over 18 to 24 months if you prefer. So this technique, which is called dollar cost averaging, ensures that you'll buy more shares when prices are low and then fewer when they're expensive. And for that reason, it's often held up as a recipe for higher long-term returns. Now, in fact, it's not. Studies on dollar cost averaging have shown pretty consistently that you would have enjoyed higher returns about two-thirds of the time if you had invested the lump sum on day one. But I'm suggesting this technique not because it's likely to lead to higher returns. The point is that investing gradually is better than procrastinating. So if this strategy makes you less anxious and more confident about executing your long-term plan, then there's a lot of value there. Now, even then, be aware that this might not be as easy as it sounds. Uh, Dollar cost averaging can turn one hard decision into several hard decisions. So if you're going to do this, I suggest marking the dates on your calendar. 
Okay, don't tell yourself you're going to invest the next portion when it feels right or when there's a 5% pullback or any other condition. Trust me, you won't do it. So pick the dates in advance and stick to your schedule. I understand investing a large sum is stressful, and it should be. It's quite possible that you will feel a sting of remorse in the short term, but you're not likely to regret it over the long term. So try not to focus so much on the timing. The best time to invest is when you have the cash and a well thought out plan. I hope that answers your question, Stephen. If you have an investing question for Dan, please send it to mail at canadiancouchpotato.com and he may answer it on a future podcast. And that's all we've got for you in this episode. Another big shout out to the folks who make it happen behind the scenes. Nick Jaworski, Tara Hunt, Nicole Pomeroy, Amanda DL, and the rest of my colleagues at PWL Capital. Don't forget to leave us a review or rating on iTunes if you like what you hear. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.